So today we're very happy to have our last two speakers for the Vantage Seminar in 2020. And we're going to start with Padma Srinivasa, who is speaking about computing exceptional primes associated to Gawa representations of abelian surfaces. Thank okay, and Padma, is it okay if we record this talk? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I want to start off by thanking the ISOM organizers for making sure this uh, workshop happened despite the pandemic. I've had a lot of fun working with my amazing uh, collaborators on this project. It's nice, it was nice to be able to speak to them periodically despite everything that's going on right now. Um, so, and I also want to thank the Vantage uh, organizers for the chance to speak here. We are very excited to share some of our uh, uh, results so far. Um, so, um, and uh, my collaborators on this project are Barinder Singh Banwet, uh, Arman Brahmar, Kian Jung Kim, Zev Klagsbrun, Jacob Meili, and Isabel Wood. Um, so we're going to tell you about some Galva representations. Um, to set, set the context, I should tell you first about uh, Serre's open image theorem. So um, let me get started by first uh, talking about Galva groups. Um, so the very first time we learn about Galva groups, we, we, think, we learn to think of Galva groups as the set of symmetries of, of, um, of roots of a polynomial. So you start with a polynomial over the rational numbers and um, the set of roots of this polynomial in an algebraic closure are permuted by the Galva group. The Galva group is exactly the permutations of roots of the polynomial. Right, so that's how we are introduced to the Galva group. Um, as we get a little older, we learn that the Galva group also acts on other things. Right, so if um, I see Professor Silverman's in the audience, uh, so we all uh, the next thing we learn in a number theory class is maybe about elliptic curves. So if we start with an elliptic curve over the rational numbers, or say an, an abelian variety, um, you can uh, look at the set of torsion points. Um, of this abelian variety defined over Q bar, right? So the, the set, of, set of torsion points is again permuted by the Galva group. And um, you can further generalize this. You can replace an abelian variety, a nice group variety by any, any, any nice variety. And you can look at um, how the Galva group acts on the et al fundamental group or the et al cohomology group. So this H1 here is some kind of generalization of, of all the L to the N torsion points on an abelian variety, right? So there are various generalizations of this, but why do we study actions of the Galva group at all? And the reason is that if we understand the Galva action well enough, we can go back and say something about the geometry of these underlying varieties. For instance, uh, again, the action of the inertia group can tell you um, what, what the reduction of A mod L looks like. Right? So this is for the graduate students in the audience, it might be nice to look up what the neuronog Shefirovich criterion is. Right? So the Galva action knows about the reduction type of A mod L. And uh, if you're in the other Vantage talks in the seminar, you might have also seen that it's really fruitful to study the fundamental group, uh, Galva action on the fundamental group or Galva action on, on the et al cohomology group. These can tell you uh, quite a bit about where, where to find rational torsion points on X, right? So we have good reason to study Galva actions. Um, all right, so what's the first kind of question, maybe, or maybe not the first question, but a question you can ask about Galva actions. Uh, one thing we learned in our first Galva theory course is that generically, if you choose a polynomial at random, we expect the Galva group to be the full symmetric group, right? So we expect something like this should hold in general. So the image of the Galva group under um, any such action should be as large as possible unless there's good reason for it not to be, right? So uh, what kind of restrictions does the Galva group uh, have to satisfy? If you think about this, the Galva group has to respect any symmetries of the underlying variety, right? So in, in the case of an abelian variety, the Galva group has to, has to the Galva action has to basically commute with all endomorphisms of the abelian variety, right? So um, finite index uh, subgroup of GQ commutes with endomorphisms. 
So if you're thinking about this very concretely, if you're thinking of the Galva, Galva action in terms of matrices, this is saying that the only matrices allowed are matrices that commute with certain other matrices, right? So the general philosophy is larger the geometric endomorphism ring, the smaller the, the Galva image should be, right? Fewer matrices you can get. Um, so that's all very well, that's a nice principle, but it's a different matter to actually prove uh, if, if, if you're in the situation where, the, where uh, the endomorphism ring is as small as possible. So uh, an abelian variety is a group, so it has all the multiplication by n maps. Um, so that's, that's the Z is the smallest the geometric endomorphism ring can be. So if, if, if the geometric endomorphism ring is small, does it actually mean that the image of the Galva group is large? Right. So this is one restriction we, we can think of. Is it the only restriction? Right. So, so the first theorem um, that um, validates this principle goes back to Serre in 1972, and this is the open image theorem I alluded to earlier. So he showed in 1972 that if you have an elliptic curve over the rational numbers, which um, where the geometric endomorphism ring is as small as possible as Z. Then he showed that uh, the Galva action on all the M torsion, you don't, you don't have to fix an M, you can study the Galva action on all the M torsion at once. Then uh, the Galva the representation maps the GL2Z hat. He showed that this has open image, right? Um, I, I'm stating it in this form, but it's, make some remarks. This, this holds more generally over any number fields. It's not just true in dimension one. Uh, it's important for us that it also, also holds in dimension two, dimension six, dimen and any odd dimension. I wonder the moment I say this, like what happens at four? Um, and as good reason four is not in this list is because the conjecture is true, uh, is false when the dimension is four, right? So uh, anytime you come up with a nice principle, you should be you should be wary that is just a principle, right? So um, in, in dimension four, there are some, sub, some abelian varieties which have some extra symmetries and the Galva group, ha, Galva action has to preserve these additional symmetries, right? So, um, so this, this, this is a theorem that va validates this belief. For us, what's important is a consequence of this theorem. Um, so what we're going to be focusing on is the mod L image. One, one consequence of the, of the open image theorem is that if you take this representation and you further look at the, compose this with the projection to Z mod uh, LZ. So in the, in the case of elliptic curves, I'll denote this rho EL. One consequence of the open image theorem is that this rho EL is surjective for almost all L. And by almost all L, I mean all but finitely many L. Okay, let you uh, give you a minute to think about this. Uh, the moment I tell you something is true for almost all L, you're very tempted to ask the next natural question. Um, if I give you an elliptic curve, if I give you an equation y squared equals f, can you actually tell me what the exceptions are in this theorem? Can you find all the finitely many L where rho EL is non-subjective? So this explains the exceptional I had in my title. Um, so for elliptic curves, this is actually known, and you can go find this on the LMFTB. The answer is yes, and it's actually implemented for number fields. So here's a snapshot from uh, what you can see on LMFDB. Um, and you can do more than just say whether the representation is subjective or not. You can actually, Drew can actually tell you what uh, the image of the Galva group is. All right. Um, so that's, that's the first question, you, follow up question. Uh, you, you can ask once I tell you the open image theorem. Um, there are other, other questions too that are famously still open to date. Um, they are already open in dimension one for elliptic curves. This uh, says uniformity question, which asks, is there a uniform upper bound on the largest non-subjective prime? Uh, there's also this whole industry of people um, trying to compute all, all elliptic curves with a certain Galva image. So that's Maisel's program B. I'm sure there are a lot of people in the audience who can, who can tell you a lot more about these problems. Um, all right, so what was our goal? So our goal um, uh, for our project uh, in June was to study the dimension two case. So we are going to be working with um, 
a genus two curve over Q. So this is very concrete, it's given by an equation y squared equals f of x, unlike elliptic curves. So here we'd be focusing on f, which has degree five or six. Um, like said, we're going to only study those where the Jacobian, that's our abelian variety, the Jacobian of C, we're only going to study those where uh, the Jacobian has geometric endomorphism ring Z, all right? Um, it's very important for us that we are over Q. You will hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll see why. Um, what Sir tells us is that um, rho AL is subjective for all, almost all L. Um, the target of this, of this homomorphism, rho AL mod model um, Galva representation is GSP4, not a GL4, because there's an extra pairing that the Galva, Galva action has to um, respect. So rho AL maps GQ to GSP4. And for almost every L, uh, this representation is subjective. So our goal was to find, find a complete list of L for which rho AL is non-subjective. Right, and um, our code is now available on LMFDV's Olive Branch. Um, so, for example, if you take this curve uh, 8450A, LMFDV label 8450.A.84501, the only non subjective primes uh, here are 2 and 13. Um, every other prime, uh, which is not 2 or 13, rho AL is subjective. Our code can actually tell you a little can give you a little more extra information. We are still documenting exactly what we mean by image type and so on. Hopefully this will be up uh, soon. Um, but we very much welcome any feedback you have to offer or any suggestions for features you'd like to see from such a code, please let us know, All right? Um, okay, so now that I've told you what our goal is, let me jump on and tell you what we actually do to compute these exceptional primes associated to um, a Gala representations of abelian surfaces, right? So our, our method has two steps. Um, so the first step, we first uh, find a finite list of primes that contains all the primes where rho AL is possibly non-surjective. This list might be a little too big. It might have a few false positives. So our second step is to take this list and for each prime in this list, check whether rho AL is actually surjective or non-surjective, right? So two steps generate all L, weed out all the fake or false positives. Um, there are three main ingredients um, that go into this proof. And uh, the first is a very classical ingredient. It goes back to the classification of maximal subgroups of uh, GSP4FL. Uh, this goes back to Mitchell from 1914. Um, then in 2002, uh, Dulefe came up with some uh, criterion for the Galva image to be contained in each of these subgroups. So if, if the Galva image is contained in one of these maximal subgroups, there are restrictions on what, what the characteristic polynomials of Frobenius, what the matrices for Frobenius elements need to look like. So he did a careful analysis of what it means for the Galva image to be contained in each of these maximal subgroups. So the main, the main thing, like I just said, is to study the profiles of characteristic polynomials of Frobenius elements at various primes. So these are the three main uh, ingredients. Um, so let me jump on and uh, tell you what, what the classification of maximal subgroups of GSP4 looks like. For those of you familiar with the elliptic curve story, this is the analog. These are the analogs of your Borel subgroups and normalizers of Cartan subgroups, right? So as before, you have stabilizers of flags. All of these subgroups have some kind of geometric flavor. Uh, they are matrices that preserve some configuration inside, inside your four-dimensional vector space. Um, you have stabilizers of linear subspaces. Those are your parabolic subgroups. And there are also stabilizers of some nonlinear configurations. I'm just listing them here. Um, and there are also some exceptional maximal subgroups. Except, uh, sorry, sorry for overusing the word exceptional here. These are just maximal subgroups that don't fit into the other, uh, other four. And the reason we care about this is, uh, is just this, is this fact that if rho AL is non-subjective, it means the image of rho AL must be contained in one of these, all right? Um, already, um, Reno tells us we can cross off one of the things in this list. Um, there's quite a bit we know about what Galva representation should look like. 
So Reno very carefully studied uh, the image of inertia. There are some restrictions on what the uh, image of the inertia subgroup can look like. And if you look at, if you look at those restrictions, that straight away rules out the Gala image being contained uh, in a stabilizer of a twisted cubic. So you, are, you, you ruled out one fifth of your cases. He, he can also tell you that you only, you only have to worry about these type five maximal subgroups for small L, for L less than or equal to seven, All right? So, um, so we are already making progress. Um, so what I'm going to do now is not tell you about how the proof works in all of these cases. It's a case by case analysis. I'm going to pick out what we think is one of the more interesting cases and hopefully we'll also tell you why we, why we really want to work over Q. I need a little bit of notation, right? So um, for this, um, uh, for talking about the rest, I, I need to, I need, N is going to be the conductor of my abelian, uh, abelian surface. Like I said, our main technique is to sample various uh, uh, Frobenia elements at auxiliary primes. So P is going to be a prime of good reduction, prop P, uh, the uh, Frobenius element at P. Uh, LP is going to be the integral characteristic polynomial of Frobenius. There's a polynomial with Z coefficients, right? And you're going to see now, uh, we also, uh, there's some modular forms also showing up. So we have standard notation s2 gamma naught d the space of weight two cusp forms of level d and apf the fourier p fourier, fourier coefficient of a cusp form f so the case i'm going to tell you about in step one so where we generate a list of primes uh, is going to be one of these borel cases uh, what we call the two plus two self dual summons um, so if the galva image is not subjective it means the representation breaks up somehow so in, in this case we're going to assume that um, Rho AL breaks up into two two-dimensional pieces, uh, pi one and pi two, two uh, two-dimensional sub-representations, and each of these representations has determined the cyclotomic character. All right, so uh, we want to find all L such that this happens. So the first question you can ask is: Can I say anything more about what these sub-representations actually look like? And yes, you can. So this this we can thanks to Serre's conjecture or the curry vinton burgett theorem it tells you that these two representations are modular they come from uh way two cusp forms each of these pi i is the same as the representation associated to a way two cusp form and you can do even more you can control the level of these you can say which level these cusp forms show up so the product of the levels of f1 and f2 just from this decomposition you can conclude must divide the conductor of your uh, abelian surface. All right, so making some progress, we are studying L's such that this breaks up. We know these represent sub representations should come from modular forms. Um, so we want to understand for which L this can happen. At the end, the shape of our criterion, the answer we're going to give you is going to, is going to be all L that divides some number, right? So we have to take this decomposition and somehow make some condition for L to satisfy out of this, right? So what can you do with this decomposition, right? So this is the composition of representations. You can test what they do, what they say for specific Galva elements, right? And we have favorite Galva, Galva elements. What can you do? You can study inertia subgroups, you can study Prometheus elements. That's all you can do, right? So if you compare what these two sides have to say um, for a Frobenius element at a good prime, and you compare the characteristic polynomials, it tells you the characteristic polynomial uh, of prop P has to factor this way um, mod L, right? Or um, another way of saying this is that um, if you take one of these polynomials that comes from uh, a modular form, this has to share a root with the L polynomial at P, right? So uh, this is the basis for uh, our uh, criterion. So this, is, this tells us that there is some modular form, um, uh, some cusp form, way two cusp form. We can also say what its, its level should be. Its level can be at most the square root of n. And um, L has to divide 
the resultant, so what does it mean for this polynomial, this polynomial to share a common factor? It means the resultant is zero, right? So um, zero mod L. So that's the same thing as saying L divides the resultant of these two guys, right? So this is, this is the shape of our criterion. And actually in our code, we don't do this model, uh, cusp form by cusp form. There's a way to ha actually handle all, all cusp forms at once. Uh, this, some, this is actually a computational optimization that helped us quite a bit. There's, some, there's a pre-computed Hecker characteristic polynomial in Sage that we make use of in our code. All right, so every, every, for each maximal subgroup in our list, uh, our criterion for all else that, fall, that could possibly fall in that list all look like this. They all look like L divides something. And this is the most interesting case. And you can see why it was important. We are over Q, right? We used modularity. All right, so that's all I'm gonna say about step one. So let me tell you about step two. At this stage, what do we have? We have a list of primes where rho L is possibly non-subjective. So for each of these primes, we actually want to go ahead and see is rho L subjective at this prime or not, right? What do we know? We know that if rho L is subjective, we should see every kind of characteristic polynomial of Frobenius elements. We should be able to see a Frobenius element whose characteristic polynomial is irreducible. We should be able to see a Frobenius element whose trace is not zero and has characteristic polynomial factors a certain way, right? Uh, what helps us at this stage is if you find Frobenius elements that satisfy these two criterion, actually that's enough um, to guarantee that you're subjective, right? Uh, so this is a purely group theoretic criterion for when, when you fill up all of GSP4, right? So this, this criterion is for non-exceptional subgroups for, for uh, small primes. Like I said, Reno tells us we only have to worry about exceptional subgroups for small primes. Uh, we separately handle those cases, all right? So purely group theoretic criterion. Uh, so that's, that's basically our two steps. So if we run this for each of the primes in our list from step one, we can test if each of those is subjective or not. Uh, so I'm, I'm at the 22 minute mark. So let me just uh, quickly show you some, some results we see from our, from our code. Um, first, like uh, the prime L equals two is easy. Actually, this just goes back to good old Galva theory, right? So if you write your hyperliptic curve as y squared equals f of x, what is the Galva action on the two torsion? It's basically the Galva action on the roots of f. And uh, you can see there are a lot of, uh, we, we tell, ran our code on all the curves in LMFDB. I meant to include some running time in these slides, but we didn't get around to this, but running our code on all the cur curves in LMFDB on MIT's Legendre computer took about five or six days. Um, but yeah, at two, this is the answer. A lot of them are non-subjective at two. And this is why we wanted to throw them out. It skewed up all our graphs. There's a lot of non-subjective primes at two. Um, what about odd primes? What we saw, uh, the largest one we saw from the curves in LMFDB was 29, there was just one curve. Uh, there are a lot of them that were non-subjective at three, some at five and so on. And you can see this graph and you can see the slides too. All right, so, hey, we did something. Um, but we're math mathematicians, we want to explain what we see. So I want to ask you all quickly, um, does anyone in the audience want to give me a possible reason uh, for why rho L might be non-subjective. What's the first reason that comes to mind? Extra endomorphism. Oh, no, we're fixing the endomorphism ring to be Z, right? Uh, we won't apply Sayre's theorem. So you mean what's the second reason that comes to mind? <laughs> oh, yes, second reason. Could it be a bad reduction? Uh, uh, no, we are actually, uh, we throw in all the primes of bad reduction into our list and sift through them later. But I see John Voigt saying non-trivial torsion. Hey, thank you. Great, three reasons, excellent. They all bring up different, uh, different things we need to worry about, and we do. Um, so yeah, the, the simplest thing is that the, there might be a non-trivial flag um, the Galva group has to preserve, right? So the Jacobian might have rational L torsion or a slightly souped up version for this. Even if your Jacobian does not have torsion, it might be a sergeant to something that has torsion, so on. Right? So some reasons we could think of. And of course, we immediately went back and looked at our examples to see which of our examples could we explain using just torsion. And you can see the green ones are the ones we could explain. But what's mysterious, there are quite a few that we still can't explain using just torsion. What else is going on, right? We still have some mysteries to solve. We're quite excited about this. We still 
talking about uh, what to, where to go with this. Um, I see I'm at my 25 minute mark. Uh, I let you all look at the slide at your own time. Um, yeah, isogeny blocks subjectivity. Those, those are all reasons um, for being non-subjective. Right, so this this the example that showed up earlier. Step one returned all these primes, and with, with our code from step two, we tuned it down to the smaller list. This is a non-torsion example. Um, sorry, I'm just going to take one minute to say there are lots of open questions still. Right, I give you a good reason why we are over Q, but there are like other small number fields for where modularity is known. So maybe we could try those. Uh, dimension larger than two. Uh, I think maybe we could do dimension three. We haven't talked about this yet, but uh, there are limitations to our technique. Um, and uh, the really interesting thing would be to do what Drew does, which is actually compute the Galva image. Um, so he has these really nice subgroup signatures. In, in, you, if you compute enough about the Frobenius elements, you should be able to tell. Uh, you should be able to tell whether um, the, what the Galva image actually is. But uh, the real thing is I've been lying to you a little bit. All of our method uh, uh, really uses the fact that eventually Frobenius element should fill up the whole group. And in our code, for, for example, in this, in this example, we tried all Frobenius elements up to 10,000. But does that actually guarantee we've hit every single uh, conjugacy class? Right? Chebyshev of density tells you that uh, you're going to eventually hit everything, but it would be nice to have an effective upper bound on how far out you have to go. All right, sorry I went a minute over. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you so much, Padma. Um, there are a lot of interesting comments in the chat. Uh, anyone want to say something? Oh, I see a lot of them are by, uh, by my collaborators. <laughs> It's been really fun working with all of them and having something nice to look forward to every few weeks during the pandemic. So thanks, thank you all very much. Thanks to the ISOM organizers for making this happen. Um, yeah, wonderful. Okay, well, this um, this chat window is just exploding with ideas here. Oh, Wait, did Bjorn okay. just like throw down the equation of a curve that he happened to know as a 29 torsion point? That's insane, Bjorn. Did you just have that? In your oh, mind. I just, yeah, I just remember it. I, yeah. <laughs> it was all in here. No, I'm just kidding. Well, our teammate Arman Brahmar is the same. Like he he knows all these examples of trends he computed a while ago. It's like, hey, we should run our code on this. Mm -hmm. it's really great having having people who, who can pull off curves of the top of the head. Yeah. Oh. Vladimir uh, asked an interesting question. Uh let me what's the largest non-isogeny example? Uh, collaborators, can you help me out? I uh, I don't know the top of my head. Does um, anyone the, anyone else in the group want to take this? I think it's twenty nine. What Is that right? I think it's thirteen, isn't it? The others. Oh, is it seventeen and twenty nine? Had probably. I've forgotten these three. Yeah, examples. the twenty nine is distortion. So okay. does a seventeen? Okay. All right. But uh, oh, 13, there's a, 13 is more interesting because there's a two-dimensional um, non-singular, two-dimensional non-singular subspace. So oh, yeah, I should say that Arman really likes this example. You should, you should totally ask him about this example. He has a lot more to say. This is really fun. Okay, wonderful. Well, let's thank Padma again.